Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. The local time is 8.49 a.m. And in about 11 minutes, we will begin our program discussing the Milankovitch cycles. Good morning, Lynn, Mike, Jamie and Heather, Carl. Scrolling too fast now, but Belgium, Alberta, good morning. Jack, good morning, Melissa, Jocelyn. So nice to see you all this morning. Leavenworth, another Brussels, or another Belgium, excuse me. Thousand Oaks, California, Australia, all streaming live into this small backyard in this small town in the middle of Washington State. It's terrific to have you all with us this morning. It's a sleepy morning here. Dead calm conditions. Overcast, the sun's trying to break through, which is a surprise because it was awfully dark and gloomy about an hour ago. And I think weather is uh, supposed to be wet all weekend. So I think we'll almost certainly be in the front porch tomorrow morning. Hello, sleepy morning here in Japan. Great. Sleepy mornings are kind of nice. Another Japan, good morning. Got a few walkers out here, no muffler boys yet, but that'll soon change. Oh, thank you. You're commenting on the paint? Yeah, can you? Yep, yeah, the guys did a good job. If we were with us on, what was it, Thursday? You got a chance to say hi quickly to Alex from Casablanca Painting. So I asked Liz, what are we doing today? Are we going to hike? She's like, no, we're nesting. Jack's coming home on Monday and going to stay with us for a while. So we got to get the house ready. We also have to pick up a bunch of paint chips. I'm like, all right, can't wait for that. So, such is life in middle America. Ava, Colette, and Connell from Portland. Hi, kids. Evelyn and Isaac, good morning. Hello, JD in England and uh, Moto Mining. No idea what this Milankovic cycle is. That makes two of us. I've been doing some, doing some learning. My brain hurts, actually. Ryan and Jack, good morning, you teenagers. I hope you're enjoying these. UK, British Columbia, Prince George, always wanted to go up there. Hello from Spain, hello Stacy. Patrick and Evelyn. Patrick is here. Gorham, Maine, Mancova, Mancova, a town in Maine. I have one thank you this morning. A little uh, thin, uh, wispy little uh, package. And Dan from Everett. Thank you, Dan. Dan sent me an original Grand Coulee of Washington and Dry Falls. This was written by Joe McMacken. And uh, it's in pretty good shape. Black and white photos from the Grand Coulee and Dry Falls, but 
if you've been a, a regular with us, you know that I'm very interested in those three Spokane high school teachers, and Rick Mann was one of them at Lewis and Clark High School. And to me, those three high school teachers in Spokane remain the missing part of the Brett's story. I still am trying to figure out how much did those high school teachers figure out on their own? How much did they tell Brett's? Why didn't Brett's credit them if they gave, <laughs> if they gave him all these field sites and ideas to flesh out? But there's some hints here and there that suggest, that suggest that those, oh boy, it's one of those mornings. Come on now, come on, baby, come on. I got a la 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 la. There's enough clues to suggest that uh, McMacken and Large and Troth, the high school teachers in Spokane, played a significant role in at least getting Brett started thinking about Missoula floods. So I continue to hold out hope that some of you might have some sort of link, some sort of uncovered part of that story with the Spokane teachers. But thank you, Dan and Everett, for the gift. I'm very appreciative. You're tuning in uh, live here on Saturday morning at 9 p.m. I'm going to go do some jumping jacks in just a second. So 9 a.m., we're talking about the Milankovic cycles. That will start in just a few minutes. And then tomorrow morning, you are welcome to come back. 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. The anniversary date is May 18th, of course, but... We don't do live streams on Monday, so we're choosing to do it tomorrow morning. And I haven't even begun to think about what we're doing tomorrow. I've been focusing so much on today. I'm playing with all sorts of props here, trying to think of how we can do this talk about the Milankovitch cycles. Thought I'd use an apple and send a ratchet in there, but I, I kind of missed, kind of off center. <laughs> No, I have a plan. We'll see if it works. I watched the replay of Thursday's session with sedimentary and metamorphic rocks, and we had major buffering issues, and it remains a mystery. A few of you pointed out that as soon as I really started moving the ladder around dramatically, that's kind of when our buffering began, and, and I agree with you. But... I've been pretty aggressive with that ladder position in previous sessions and it didn't seem to be a problem, so whatever. We'll just cross our fingers. I guess I will ask right now, how are we doing this morning uh, with the streaming, with the audio, with the visual? We doing okay? Thank you. Yeah, I jinxed it the other day. I said, we're, we're in good shape. I don't even have to check anymore. And then, of course, we had major problems on Thursday night. But in the replay, there were a few glitches here and there, but it was I think it was functional. I think you could follow along. I don't think you, like, missed out on huge chunks of it. But, you know, I like to be casual and free and kind of freelancing. But at the same time, I like things to be very strong with technology and then even just kind of the delivery of the material. So I do have certain standards. And so when that's kind of skittish, I get a little ticked off. I got two minutes. I need to think quite seriously and concentrate quite carefully this morning. And you'll see why in just a second. So I'm leaving you for two minutes. 
to clear my head if that's possible, wake my mouth up a little bit more, wake my mouth up a little bit more, wake my mouth up a little bit more. Let's see if we can't make this worthwhile for you this morning. Thanks for joining us. Well, good morning, everybody. Class is in session. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're talking about the Milankovitch cycle this morning, and my name is Nick Zentner. I'm a geology instructor here at the college in Ellensburg, Washington. It's called Central Washington University. We've been out of session since mid-May. As most universities around the world, we've been teaching from home. I've been teaching my classes online. And in addition to that, I've been doing these live streams from my home just for fun, basically, and just to kind of keep things fresh and just to add some stuff to put on my calendar, basically, because I get a little unnerved when there's days and days and days that there isn't something scheduled. I like to stay busy and productive. And so the first, I don't know, 40 of these live streams were pretty easy for me to do. I just decided I'll just, you know, kind of share many of these past programs that I've put on YouTube and have shared with the public and in some cases, I would actually have to re-watch what I did uh, a few years ago and remind myself and take a few notes from my program online, kind of weird, and then uh, kind of dust it off and, uh, and have some live Q&A after we talk about some of those ideas. Well, this morning is very different. This morning is material I have never taught. This morning is content that I never really had clear in my head until about 24 hours ago. And I had a good session yesterday morning, Friday morning, at the kitchen table uh, using uh, many links that many of you all sent to me. So thank you for your generosity. In addition to some, a couple of science papers and a couple of uh, uh, astronomy people who helped me just guide me just a little bit. And so you're like, well, okay, I'm new to this guy. I'm watching this program. I've Googled Milankovitch cycles, and I got to this guy in the uh, tan shirt. What's up? Is this some sort of expert? And the answer is no. So maybe the charm of this is you're watching a guy who's learning it as you're learning it. And I have some skill as a presenter and some ways to kind of organize and connect some dots that maybe weren't there before. Um, but I am no expert on this topic. This is the third of our climate history lectures, live streams in other words. And a while back we did ice age climate and that's something I've taught forever involving deep sea sediments and we'll refer to that just a little bit. So that felt pretty natural. I didn't need to, need to prep at all for that. And then the next day, I think it was a Sunday, uh, I had a session on volcanoes and climate. And that it was new to me and I wanted to explore a few of those ideas and I was all ready for a bunch of you know, angry comments and this is all baloney and that sort of thing. And there, there's a little bit of that, but not a whole lot. This is a decent community we have. 
uh, but I presented that as kind of a workshop scene. Well, this is kind of that. I'm hoping to learn from you, especially after you hear what I have for you with the Milankovitch cycles. A, I'm interested in what you see as incorrect. I suppose there'd be a few mistakes as I try to deliver what I learned 24 hours ago. But B, I'm looking to uh, expand my knowledge of this story. My last preamble before we get started is that, of course, this whole business of climate history has been hijacked by many different groups. And as a result, there's many different conflicting messages on YouTube, in the media, in, even in science, in scientific papers. And it's hard to know who to believe. And so all I ask, uh, if you're ready, if, you, if the guns are blazing and you're ready to go, this, this guy, I'm going to vote big thumbs down on Milankovitch cycles existing, number one, I'm sure of that. And number two, uh, you know, even if it does exist, I'm going to just, I'm just going to blow this guy out of the water and say this is, this is like nothing compared to sunspots or compared to, take your pick, cows uh, farting in the field, whatever you want, okay? So everybody seems to have their angle, and I am not equipped to have that debate. My goals are simple this morning. Let me show you the plan for this morning. It's a three-act play this morning. Who was Milankovitch? When did he live? Why was he working on climate history when he was living? And where was he living? Second, the obvious guts of the plan this morning, and then I have a prop. I have two props. I have a lamp, have you noticed? And uh, I have an apple, a different apple that I showed you in the, in the, in the, in the pre-show. And so I want to demonstrate my best understanding of this. I've seen this in textbooks for years. I never really tried to work it for my brain. And I think it works for my brain now, and maybe if I demonstrate it properly, it will work for your brain. And finally, uh, one of the biggest messages uh, from this morning is that Milankovitch was doing his mathematical modeling involving astronomy and Earth-Sun positions decades before we started drilling into ice and before we started drilling into the deep sea sediment. And unfortunately, it wasn't until after his death that all of his amazing mathematical work was finally confirmed with real field evidence on planet Earth. And the real field evidence is layers of ice in Greenland and Antarctica and layers of deep sea sediment in the ocean floors of the world. So it's one of those sad stories Alfred Wegener, uh, the, the brainchild of uh, uh, Pangaea and continental drift. He died before his ideas were accepted by science and he was heralded as a hero. J. Harlan Bretz thankfully lived long enough that he saw his ideas accepted. But old Malutin Milankovitch, our hero of today, uh, died long before we now realized that his work was very valuable and a major part of the last 2.6 million years worth of global climate change. Okay, let's get into it. I got all sorts of stuff written out, mainly because I've never given this before and I, I kind of want to follow my notes and I've written my notes nice and big so we can all kind of look at the notes together. So to me, and I think to many, the story starts in the Alps in the 1840s. And if you don't know the name Louis Agassiz, he's a hero to many of us in geology. You know, the heroes are the people who can actually think outside the box, who can have a rare gift of not only imagining something, but then having the ability to document it, to actually do the scientific research to, to, to work into their theories. And by the way, just another preamble. Have you ever said to one of your friends, oh, that's just a theory? You know, evolution, that's just a theory. Milankovitch, that's just a theory. Just a theory. To me, when you say just a theory, implies that it's just an opinion. 
like there's no critical thought, like there's no, uh, there's not a lifetime worth of, of penciling out with math and physics. It's just a theory. And what you're really saying, I think, when you say it's just a theory is that, well, they have their idea, I have my idea, I guess we'll just agree to disagree. Implying that they're equal viewpoints. But we do have experts that have way more math and physics than I do. And they can back up their ideas. They can test their ideas and prove their ideas. That's a scientific process. All right. So Agassiz had this idea in the Alps that I think uh, the glaciers were much larger once upon a time and that there was something called an ice sheet and that much of the Alps, he was a Swiss fellow, so much of the Alps were under ice maybe multiple times and not just in the Alps but major portions of the European continent were under ice at multiple times. So in the mid 18 in the mid-1800s, glaciation was in the literature really for the first time. And then we jump ahead to Scotland in the 1880s, and we have a precursor to Milankovitch, who was laying the groundwork for the Milankovitch work. We could do a whole program on James Kroll, and programs have been done, but let's go ahead and give you the cliff notes. Freelancing already this morning, by the way. So James Kroll, here's his birth and death. A Scottish fellow, had some important scientific papers in the 1870s and the 1880s. And you've seen the Matt Damon movie, Goodwill Hunting. This is truly a guy who for many years was a janitor at Glasgow University which gave him access to the university library, which allowed himself to be kind of self-taught in many of these matters of earth-sun positions. And it was Kroll, uh, self-taught, who first came up with some ideas in the literature to may possibly have a link between ice ages and earth orbit variability. And his work was mostly ignored by the turn of the century, once we get to 1900. But Milankovitch, who we haven't gotten to yet, credits Kroll for kind of laying the groundwork with some of these ideas. And uh, let's go ahead and jump right to the star of the show then, Malutin Milankovitch. Let me give you a similar look at his life. So Kroll is, has passed away by 1890 in Scotland. But here's our buddy Malutin Milankovitch, born in the late 1800s and lives... Um, through the Cold War, essentially, or much of it, we're over to Serbia, and this is a life's work now for Milankovic. He has a very interesting life. We could spend hours and hours talking about just his life and all of his challenges. But he was a mathematician, first of all, but also worked with astronomy and civil engineering, uh, geophysics, um, all sorts of, of kind of quantitative aspects uh, to his work, uh, but he took Kroll's ideas and started penciling them out, essentially. And this is before computers and Excel spreadsheets, etc. And so he's truly spending hours upon hours each week working on these calculations, trying to prove that there is some long-term climate change due to Earth orbit variability, very similar to what Kroll was saying. But Malutin had the mathematical ability and the time and the dedication uh, to pencil this out. And what he came up with, these Milankovitch cycles, uh, are the topic right here. And you'll get my version, hopefully the best version for me, for my brain, of what he was able to put together. But this is sad because all those books and papers and his culminating book was in 1941 at the dawn of World War II uh, was not accepted, uh, not given much credence. And so now we're to the 1970s. Let me show you my Geology 101 textbook from the early 1980s. I've showed this to you before. 
I still have my hardcover textbook from Geology 101 in 1984, University of Wisconsin. Here's my little highlighted sections as I was studying for an exam. And we're talking about um, causes of glaciation in a textbook written in the late 1970s. There's no mention of Milankovitch. There's thought of possibly an astronomical hypothesis, but no name or no expansion on that. Given, given equal billing, atmospheric changes, oceanic controls, continental drift. This, this, I'm, I'm learning this as a young student. And so there's been this confirmation of Milankovitch's work and really Kroll's work before him by this amazing field evidence that was collected in the 1970s, really started in the 1960s, was starting to drill into Greenland and Antarctica, and then the deep sea sediment stuff as well. And, you know, as the, as the data continued to pour in, somebody said, hey, I think somebody had already kind of predicted all this stuff. In other words, we see things in the ice and in the deep sea sediment that confirms the cycles that Milankovitch was talking about. So, sad that he didn't get a chance to see uh, or hear the fact that we're actually teaching his stuff. I'm still kind of in the preamble. I feel like the context for this is important and I certainly didn't have it. And you know, I like telling stories. And so we're getting here in just a second, but I feel like the context of this might be just as interesting to help us kind of see where we are today in our understanding of global climate history changes. So this was the backyard during that Volcanoes and Ice Age talk. And I just want to remind you that we had a discussion of the most recent 2.6 million years worth of time. And that is where we are today. These squiggles back and forth, these ice uh, advances and retreats, ice advances and retreats, my number was 33 advances and 33 retreats of the ice globally in the last 2.6 million years. That is our topic today. Our topic today is not these much older ice ages. And our topic is not this incredible amount of time during the dinosaurs, for instance, in the Mesozoic era, where we didn't have ice. So we made this point last time. But if you go back to a much longer time frame, there's going to be a lot of squiggly charts here this morning. You knew that if it was going to be a climate talk, right? There's plenty of ways to look at our geologic past, but notice these are in hundreds of millions of years, hundreds of millions of years, not the last 2.6. So to not, to this morning, we're talking about the last 2.6 million years worth of time. I can't emphasize that enough. We get into this. The last 2.6 million years, that's here. But notice that we've had mostly warm times in our geologic past. We do have some much older ice ages of yesteryear, but we know very little about the fine-tuned cycles going on back then. Feeling okay? Feeling like we have a little bit of background? Here's Malutin himself, Malutin Milankovitch. And his mathematical work was really kind of focusing on these two statements that I tried to write down. He was focusing on solar radiation coming in at a high latitude, almost near the Arctic Circle. So 65 degrees north. And he knows that seasonally there's a 25% variability in the solar radiation that's coming in, the solar insulation that's striking the Earth at that particular latitude which is a latitude that seems to have the most, uh, I think that latitude's important, correct me if I'm wrong. By the way, I'm not gonna be apologizing all through this and say I'm not sure. You've already heard my message and you know the context of this presentation. So I'm just gonna plow right ahead. So it seems we have most of our land masses in the Northern Hemisphere and if we can get some of that uh, winter snow to stick around for years and years and years and not melt every summer, at that latitude, that's a place where we're beginning an ice age, where we're ice making at this uh, almost to the Arctic Circle. That's what I'll keep referring to this as, almost to the Arctic Circle. But he's really trying to come up with a mathematical model to explain why you would have this variability over long periods of time 
to ultimately explain why ice ages begin when they do, or at least why we have a major ice advance, and is there a regularity to that tied to um, these kinds of relationships. So I could show you 17 different Geology 101 textbooks. They all have something that about looks like this. There's maybe a paragraph of text, and I've never taught it. I would just casually blow it off in class, or maybe a student would ask, so why, why do we have these big swings back and forth in this, in this global climate pendulum? I say, well, it's, a, it's an astronomy, this is me now, this is it for the last 30 years. Oh, it's an astronomy thing, you know, Earth, Sun positions, and there's cycles that over the course of thousands of years, and it, it all kind of works out. And the translation of that is, I never took the time to learn it. Well, I got it at least temporarily up here, and so we're ready now to try to figure out how this, this, and this, mathematically proven by Milankovitch, decades before we found ice cores and sediment cores that confirm these cycles, what did he pencil out in those long, long years in uh, the 1920s and 30s? You ready? Am I ready? <laughs> I'm ready. So I'm going to tip you down here a little bit. I've got a lamp. This is going to be our sun. Now, if you're a flat earther, I, I guess you might as well click off and go on to something else. Uh, if you're not believing that the earth uh, revolves around the sun, I suppose it should head elsewhere right now. We're going we're gonna to go in with that assumption, okay? The earth is a spheroid. It revolves around the sun 365 days to get us around the sun. Okay? This is a little, it's a little too low. I need to be able to see the full part of the board here. Okay, so we've worked with Agassiz setting the stage for glaciation, Crow with coming up with the idea of variability, and now we're talking about this. What did Malutin put together with these cycles? I'm not going to use this earth because it's squirrely. I need an axis for our rotation of the earth around its axis. I did try this uh, uh, ratchet, but I screwed up. I, I was off center by just a bit, so I'm not using that. But with the one apple we had left, pressure was on. It's a Washington apple from Wenatchee, Washington. A pink lady from the Stimolt Orchard. And I took a chopstick right between the eyes. Okay? So this is our planet, planet Earth, and this is our axis. I'm going to call it a knitting needle, okay? It's easier for me to say knitting needle than uh, chopstick, okay? Knitting needle right through our Earth. And we all know, don't we? that our planet uh, spins around this axis 24 hours a day, 24 hours to get us all the way around. Some of you are watching from the Southern Hemisphere, some are watching from the Northern Hemisphere. I notched out the equator for us. I'm already getting kind of a yellowed apple here in the notch. Feeling okay? All right, so here's our sun, here's our Earth axis. Now, I think you're aware 
that our Earth does not have an axis that's vertical. We've never had an axis that's vertical. We have an orbital plane, and we have an Earth that's going to revolve around the Sun in this orbital plane. But our axis has always had a tilt to it. And during our short time on the planet, you and I, our tilt is 23.4 degrees. I always have casually said 23 and a half, but technically it's 23.4. Okay, so let's do a little bit of geometry real quick. Okay, so there's zero degrees tilt. Here's 90 degrees tilt, that's not us. 45 degrees tilt, that's not us. It's 23.4 degrees. So like, something like that maybe, okay? 23.4 degrees. Now let me try to hold that. We're not to the cycles yet. I'm just now talking about why we have four seasons every year. Do you know this? Do you know why we have seasons? I'll do it very quickly in case you haven't heard this before. Right now, I am tilting 23.4 degrees towards the sun. And at summer solstice, in other words, next month in June, we're going to have solar rays bombarding the northern hemisphere. The sun's never going to set in the Arctic, right? And that's because our 23.4 degree tilt is right at the sun. And Kathy and everybody down in the southern hemisphere is in wintertime, not as much sun. Okay, now for this purpose, can I just focus on North America, please? Can I just focus on the Northern Hemisphere and Washington in particular? It's just the way my brain works. Don't be offended if you're in the Southern Hemisphere right now, okay? So we have summer, Washington, when we're tilting towards the sun. If we maintain that 23.4 degree tilt, but now we're in December, the northern hemisphere is dark. It's dark and the sun never comes up above the Arctic Circle because we're away from the sun. And Kathy in Australia is dealing with a lot more sun. So, northern hemisphere, summer, fall, winter, spring. I'm not talking about Milankovitch yet. I'm simply talking about our four seasons by revolving the Earth. It takes us 365 degree days to do this, doesn't it? 365 days to go around the planet and go through our four seasons with our 23.4 degree tilt. Capiche? Okay, let's get to it. These are the three cycles that are referred to as the Milankovitch cycles. They each have an awkward name, obliquity, precession, eccentricity, or eccentricity. Let's talk about the first one. Obliquity simply means tilt. And I just discussed with you that during our time on the planet, our tilt is 23.4 degrees. But Milankovitch was able to prove using mathematics that there's a 41,000 year cycle to go from a maximum tilt to a minimum tilt and back to the maximum tilt. It's going to take 41,000 years to do that, max to max. Now, these are the actual degrees of tilt, and you're like, well, wait a minute, this hard. that's hardly, it's pretty much the same. I, I can't even show you the difference between 24.5 and 22.1, right? It's all just kind of like this. But this is one of the factors ultimately controlling why we have ice ages. Be patient on seeing the connection to that in just a second. How are we doing, by the way? Sometimes when I don't see a bunch of comments, I think we've lost connection. Or the other is everybody's really concentrating and they're not ty typing a bunch of stuff about alcohol and food and everything else. We doing okay? Patrick is okay. Everybody's okay. It's just interesting. Thank you. Okay, let's proceed. So I don't know how well you can read these numbers. Many of these are very small just for notes for myself since this is the first time I've been teaching it. But let me exaggerate for you visually. 
a maximum tilt, let me get in front of the board so you can see it, a maximum tilt is tilting a little bit more away from zero, and a minimum tilt is tilting a little bit less and getting closer to zero. So it's been proven in astrophysics, Milankovitch and plenty of others, that we do have this variation in our tilt angle. It's not always 23.4. There are times that it's 24.5. That's a little bit more than it is now. And there are times when it's a little bit less than 23.4. We actually have dates. So less than 10,000 years ago, actually about 10,000 years ago, the year 8,700 BC was the last time we were at a maximum tilt, 24.5. You see, I have to cheat at my crib notes here, just like you. I can't read here because it's backwards. You can see them better than I. And we're heading for the next minimum tilt, which will be in the year 11,800 AD, like 10,000 years from now, essentially. So we're kind of in between. Our 23.4 is kind of smack dab between the max and the min. So if I do our seasonal thing, right? I got to do this every year. I got to do this 365 days a year. But somehow, as I'm doing this, I need to, over the course of 41,000 years, 41,000 trips around the sun, I need to do this very tiny tweaking in the angle of the tilt. But again, it's not an idea. It's not just a theory. It's been proven by multiple physicists and astronomers through the ages, especially in the last 100 years. That's obliquity. You'll see how that affects our global climate here in just a second, I hope. Let's move on. Procession. Wobble. So as a kid, maybe you remember having a top and you're down on all fours, you're on the kitchen table and mom and grandma are talking about uh, the gossip of the day or whatever. Maybe it's dad and the grandpa talking about the gossip. Okay. So you're minding your own business down there and somebody gave you an old school top. If you're too young to know what a top is, I don't know how to help you. But uh, basically, we in the olden days, us kids, we get that time, we spin that freaking thing. It's, a, you know, it's moving fast, and it's like a frozen rope. That thing is just not wobbling at all. all right, what was that skeet thing? I love that one, where you, like, it was like a, like a maze. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like, it was made out of wood, had all these little windows. Uh, from room to room, or doors, I guess, and you had this wooden thing. Suppose it's got a name, probably. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And you wrap the string around that wooden thing, and you lined it up with the edge of that. I just thought about this. So it's like I'm flooded with nostalgia right now. What do you do? <laughs> you pull the string on that thing, that whirling, t and you're trying to get, you're trying to watch that little whirling wooden thing how many rooms is it going to get to? Like it's a mouse looking for cheese at the end in that maze. And ultimately, that wooden spool thing, somebody's got a name for me, hopefully, probably. Battling tops, is that what I'm seeing? Whipping top, a top. Okay, your top. Um, eventually, it's, it, it, it starts to wobble, right? It's starting to slow its spin, and so it starts to... That's what we're talking about here. We don't have a spinning top, we have a spinning apple. This is the earth. And now you're gonna, I'm gonna change my orientation. You're gonna look down on our, you're looking down on the North Pole now, okay? And so I think you know what I'm about to do. Instead of just playing with our tilt angle, we're gonna have, you're looking down on the earth now, you're gonna have this wobble in the, in the position that the earth is. It's got its tilt, but over the course of a 26,000 year cycle, I know this sounds crazy, how did that guy do it? You can document, I'm gonna exaggerate it of course, this wobbles, I'm still spinning the earth, but I'm doing this, let me do it for you this way. I'm kind of tracing out a cone 
Can you see it? I'm holding the bottom steady, but I'm... Oh, the robin is loving this. I'm tracing out a cone. And now I'm tracing out the cone for you. You're looking down on planet Earth. Shut up. Thank you. So we can keep track of that wobble by looking at which star in the heavens the North Pole is pointing to. Today it points to Polaris, the North Star. And that's in the year 2020, that's us. But this is a 26,000 year cycle for the Earth's knitting needle to go through one complete wobble. And that wobble is Polaris, wobble over to a different star, Vega, continue the wobble back to Polaris. You're looking down, Polaris is over there, Vega, Polaris, Vega, Polaris, 26,000 year cycle for that. Now again, I hope you can see right off the bat that we're gonna be modifying solar insulation at that spot in the Northern Hemisphere, almost to the Arctic. What was the number? 66 degrees north, I forget what the number was. 65 degrees north. The point is, we are mathematically showing how we're screwing a little bit with the amount of solar insulation at that latitude, where we are prone to be making ice, because we're playing with the tilt, and we're also playing with the wobble of the knitting needle. I hope you're doing okay. There's one more, and the good news is the last one is the most intuitive to my brain, makes the most sense to me, and hopefully it will to you. Back down so you can see this. Eccentricity. I don't know why I'm having trouble saying that word this morning. It's like I say, I say ancient wrong. Uh, can't stop it. Uh, eccentricity, 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 Atlas. Ec eccentricity, eccentricity. So who cares? Elliptical path around the sun. This goes back before Milankovitch. I'm sure you'll have the name of the person who figured it out. Was it Kepler or Copernicus or somebody figured out that not only does the earth revolve around the sun, Remember now, I've got a tilt thing going, I've got a wobble thing going on the course of these scales. But not only is the Earth uh, revolving around the Sun, it's been proven that it's not a circular orbit all the time. Sometimes it is circular, or close to circular. But other times, you about know what I'm about to do? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Uh-oh, 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 I'm gonna go out of frame here, hang on. Uh-oh, uh-oh. I'm exaggerating now, but I'm showing you an elliptical orbit that the Earth sometimes has, as opposed to a circular orbit. Muffler boy, thank God, 937. an equidistant around the sun, more or less. This also is on a cycle. And Milankovitch figured out that a nice round number for us is every 100,000 years. You'll see some differences here in just a second. So there's some variability here, but let's just go with 100,000 just to get the concept, okay? So the idea is we're gonna go from circle to ellipse to circle, just like we did up here, remember? From max tilt to min tilt to man, ma uh, max tilt, or we went from Polaris to Vega to Polaris. In this case, let's start with a circular orbit. We're good, circular. But now over the next 50,000 years, we become more and more elliptical. elliptical and then another 50,000 years and we're back to circular again another cycle 
this is obviously the longest period for a cycle, circle to ellipse to circular over the course of 100,000 years. Now that's a rough number that works well for us, but apparently that varies due to stuff beyond me. So we can be as short a duration or cycle as 95,000 years. We can be as high as 125,000 years. And then there's an even a bigger major variation on that orbital pattern or orbital cycle every 413,000 years. And you're like, oh, tell me more about that. I'd like to learn more about that. I don't know anything about that. I took calculus too from a blind teaching assistant in Madison, Wisconsin in 1985. And I haven't had calculus or advanced math since then. Best teaching assistant I ever had, by the way. We're all sitting in that room, 25 of us, for the, for the, you know, the, the TA session, separate from the lecture session with the huge lecture hall. We're all kind of nervous. Calc 2, this is going to be really hard. Here comes this guy with the seeing eye dog coming in, like trying to find the, the chalkboard. I'm just like, are you kidding me? And this guy is working the board blind. And everything was perfect. And occasionally he'd be writing over stuff he drew, you know, a few minutes ago and we'd, you know, somebody would say, hey, uh, race first. And it was just the most beautiful, it gets me choked up just thinking about it. I should figure out what that guy's name is. What an amazing instructor. So my point is I don't have the math to help you here, but these are the three cycles. Now here's the payoff and this is what finally clicked for me yesterday morning. And I hope that this is accurate. And if you're, if you're deep into this knowledge and you know that this is incorrect, please let me know. The way these three cycles work together for my mind, because all we're trying to do is explain why we're going to be making ice occasionally near the Arctic Circle. You've already had the background on that phrase, okay? So why are we prone every once in a while to start an ice advance, to making ice uh, at the at the poles. Maybe you've already decided and figured it out for yourself. For me, I'm a slow thinker. What's going to be more favorable for ice making, max or min? Min, max, min. Oh, younger than 30 year old person. Right. No gadgets screaming at each other. Can you hear them? talking about uh, what they had for breakfast this morning. Okay, back to the program. So, min, max, min, max. Which one is more favorable to making ice? Min, right? If we max, we're tipping more towards the sun and we're getting more solar radiation. So, during our times when we are a minimum tilt, every 41,000 years, this thing go min, to the next min, to the next min, that's every 40,000 years, 41,000 years, we're gonna be a little bit more prone to making ice. And you're like, I don't know, that sounds kind of weak. Well, let's add another factor. Which is more prone to making ice? Polaris or Vega? And you're like, well, I don't know. And this one's not as intuitive to me, but the only way I can make sense of it, I'm really sketchy on this actually. You remember, this is the spinning top, this is the wobbling top. So somehow these are times when our top is wobbling away from the sun. That's all I can do. I, I, I don't know how to do more than that. Because, of course, we're not, we're not doing this every year because this is a 26,000-year 26, cycle. Anyway, um, that's my weakest argument, but I think there are times when we're, we're more... Uh, the, our our need, knitting needle is, is away from the sun more regularly because of the wobble. That's all I can say. And then I hope this one is the most clear to you, that which is more prone to ice making, circle or elliptical. Well, it's got to be elliptical, right? Because during these times that our earth is revolving so far away from the sun, because it's in a maximum elliptical part of the cycle, doesn't it make sense that would start the next ice advance? And if you recall our discussions of the 
records we have for multiple advances and retreats of the ice in the last 2.6 million years. At least in the last million years, it's been a major ice advance every 100,000 years. So to my brain, it's the, it's the uh, eccentricity, it's the elliptical nature that is, I don't know if this is inappropriate, is this a more pronounced cycle than these other two? Let's try to look at some squiggly diagrams and see if we can tease out, before we forget what these, these rings are, maybe we can tease out those differences. Uh, probably 10 of you. I'm getting hundreds of emails a day, by the way. And I just say that to say that uh, you're not hearing from me many times just because I, I, I can't keep up. But at least a dozen of you, I'd say, sent me a, 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 a link to a, a program by a guy named Dan Britt. And I thank you for that. I'd already seen the program maybe a year ago, but uh, it was good to get those links and a reminder of his talk. It's a very good talk. And I took a couple screenshots, so here's Dan. He gave a talk down in Florida. I don't know much more about him than that. Uh, but here he's trying to show us one of the classic squiggly diagrams. Look at the time frame here. We have uh, 50,000 years, 100,000 years, 150,000 years, all right? So there's like 100,000 years between these two things. And here is a plot of global warm versus global cool. And the reason I'm showing you this is to kind of give a sense of how to interpret those squiggles based on our three cycles we were just talking about. And I'll let his diagram speak for itself. But from his point of view, and for many, the Milankovitch cycles are the dominant cycle here. In other words, the astronomy, Earth, Sun, position cycles, Milankovitch cycles, are the dominant ways to explain these sudden rises in temperature and then gradual cooling. And we can even see the smaller bumps teased out from the precession and the tilt cycles. And if you're really with us and have been with us for every live stream, you remember squiggles like this when I was talking about volcanoes and Peter L. Ward was saying, this is not Milankovitch at all. This is, this is major volcanic events, effusive volcanism creating a sudden warming and then a gradual cooling uh, in response to that or maybe even some smaller um, Mount St. Helens-like eruptions. So, you know, as well as I, it depends on who you listen to on what the smoking gun is. But I don't know with all the math how you can ignore the Milankovitch cycles. I don't know how you can just say that's not a factor. And really, I don't know how you can say it's anything but a major factor. Cue the hating comments. While I'm on that kind of a thing, a theme with Dan Britt, and then I'll finish with a little bit of data from the ice cores and the deep sea sediment. And then we'll come to you with live q and I'll try. Uh, here's Dan. Again, I'm looking at it backwards, so I need to look at this with you. I wasn't really tuned in, clued into the fact, muffler boy with radio, that here's the last four million years of time. Remember, we're not going back to those ice ages of Pangea and things like that. This is, quote unquote, quite recent. But Dan and many others that I've been reading recently are, are demonstrating that here's the beginning of this ice age that we all confirm is the last 2.6 million years worth of time. Warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold, fine. But starting about a million years ago, the ice age has become more spaced out and more intense. So if you can read my chicken scratch here, it seems like between 2.6 and 1 million years ago, there's an every 41,000 year uh, squiggle. That's a familiar number. That was our tilt business. But then things, nobody's been able to explain this, by the way, even the Milankovitch people. I don't know who the man, that's, that's a good name for a rock band. Now, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for 
The Milankovitch people. But starting one million years ago, we have these more glaciations greatly increased in intensity and the periodicity is every 100,000 years. So he's enlarging that for us and showing this regular 100,000 year cycle. So why is that? Why, why would this trump this starting a million years ago if that's really what we're seeing? Uh, I'm on Dan Britt here, so I'll finish with one of his other major slides that I thought was quite interesting. And you might have to just take a screenshot of this and really look at it carefully. I don't want to hold it up here for 10 minutes. But he's basically saying, Dan Britt now is basically saying, uh, we should be cooling right now. If, if, you, if, you, if you now understand the Milankovitch cycle and you understand the periodicity of this, Dan Britt and others are basically saying we have been removed from the Milankovitch cycles because of what we've been doing in the last few thousand years and especially the last couple of hundred years. And you know what I'm talking about. But this chart, I promise I'll hold it here for a second if I can get the focus to, to work. He's basically looking at some of the cycles that are Milankovitch and looking at the past and the future. And his main point is we should be, what we're seeing in the ice core and the deep sea records, especially the ice core records are showing us that we're not following this Milankovitch cycle any longer. Obviously, a debatable topic among many, even within science. And if you are a hardcore science person and a greenhouse gas person, CO2 person, and you're just waiting for me to give that cell, uh, that's not my focus today. And I don't know that data very well. That's kind of next, I think. I think I need to do another one of these. I don't know if I'm going to promise, but I think I should do another one and look more carefully at the ice core records and the trapped gases in those bubbles. And I saw a bunch of comments the last time I did one of these climate things, and they're like, you're doing, the, you know, you're doing everybody a great disservice by minimi minimizing greenhouse gases and carbon dioxide. I, my, my, my gut feeling from dealing with so many different kinds of people, especially folks who are not into this at all, like don't that deny all of this, is that once we get into greenhouse gas discussions and, and other kind of human activity, uh, the lights just go out. Uh, that, that it's just like this guy's selling me something. And so to me, that's this threshold that I'm, I'm, I'm afraid to cross until I have enough field evidence that I can be convincing along the style of this. I hope you can understand that. Okay, I have uh, five more minutes. So to finish the story, Milankovitch passes away, a couple more decades go by, Milankovitch's work is all just like, whatever, you know, somebody lost to time, whatever, some, somebody in Serbia doing some math, eye roll. And then we start drilling into the ice and we start drilling into the deep sea sediment. And here's just a quick look at some of the work done with the deep sea, I, uh, sorry, the deep sea sediment drilling in the 1970s. So my textbook was not you know, it takes a while before the research is confirmed and then gets into textbooks. So I'm not slamming my textbook author. But these gentlemen were working in the 1970s with deep sea sediment records and being able to look at cycles of oscillating sea surface temperatures and the amount of glacial ice. That was our ice age climate talk. Remember our oxygen 16 variability with the deep sea sediment and microfossils. And you might have to go back to that live stream if you didn't see it. And then John's doing some time series stuff. I don't even know what that means. But the thing I really wanted to show you is plotting Milankovitch cycles. Look at the time frame now. This is 
You always have to do that, right? What are we looking at? The last hundred years, the last thousand years, the last million years, you know? They're all just squiggles, so that's always the first thing. Like, what part of this barcode are we looking at? In this case, they're going back a thousand years. It's also frustrating because they got sometimes present day on the right, sometimes present day on the left. But this is, I like this one because it's talking about the Milankovitch cycles we were just discussing today, contributing to variability in solar insulation or solar forcing, they're calling it, at that certain almost to the Arctic Circle. And then here's our understanding from the ice about glacials and interglacials and trying to link those up. And you're like, well, I don't know. I don't, do they link up? I'm not even sure. Well, here's another one. This is from the Vostok Antarctica Ice Core. There's lots going on here. These are overwhelming plots. But I just want to give you a sense. What are we looking at now? Present day is here. This is 420,000 years. So we have direct field evidence from the ice in Antarctica drilling through the core, drilling through the ice sheet at Antarctica. We can count years and go back 420 frickin' thousand years. I didn't know it was that long. That's impressive. Almost half a million years of direct evidence I have to do more with ice cores. I'm such a fan of putting your finger on some field evidence as opposed to invisible whatever. It feels like most of the conspiracy stuff and other kind of alternative facts movements are all based on stuff we, we can't put our finger on. I think magnetic field changes are hot in that world because you, you can't really easily see the magnetic fields or the CO2. Or have you heard in the submarine canyons underwater there's such and such? It's not, I don't think it's an accident that all these kind of inaccessible or invisible pieces of evidence are then taken and kind of hijacked for another story. But to me, if you can get to a core, put your finger on a year, capture dissolve, trapped gases and bubbles in the ice, volcanic ash layers, etc. This is like looking at layers in the Grand Canyon. At least we have a chance of having some common ground between these different groups. So I'll go back to the plot, but coming directly from ice cores that collectively go back 420,000 years, not the most sexy looking plot, but they're plotting all in the same chart here, carbon dioxide changes, methane, solar variation, that's the Milankovitch business, I'm reading backwards, oxygen isotopes, and what's that one? Relative temperatures. So if you're unaware, there is major work today and certainly has been major work for the last 50 years of taking ice core and deep sea sediment core data and trying to correlate it with these Milankovitch cycles. And that's why it's being taught now that there is an agreement between the mathematical models of James Kroll and Malutin Milankovitch and a bunch of this real data coming out of these places. The end. Thank you for your attention. It's time for some live q and I'm going to do my best to answer what you have to ask. Please proceed while I collect my laptop. This ought to be good. From Marbles Collector, what hard data did Milankovic use to be able to calculate these things? Like, how on earth did he come up with this? That's a great question. I don't know. 
So he started this work in the 1920s. And I don't think he was a total outsider. I think he was, check, I can't remember some of the famous names that he was dealing with or, or kind of working with. So I think he was able to get some data, but what data would it be? I don't think they had ice cores that early. I don't know how he was able to work like again to Dan Britt. Oh, actually, we got a little. Hold on, we got some couple of cozy fort things. You want to look at a couple of cozy fort things? Uh, it's already ten o'clock, so I'm going to give you a couple tips. Uh, there's a three-minute program on James Kroll on YouTube. It's called Roy Thompson on James Kroll. I don't want to take the time to, to watch these. I was going to, but that was really in case I kind of <laughs> had a brain problem. I just said, let's just go to YouTube. Uh, this is an excellent, I think, the best uh, program online to conceptualize the Milankovitch cycle. And, uh, and so I was so pleased with it. it. It solidified so much for me. And then I went down to the comments and I lost the will to live. Uh, and the future of our planet is, is doomed based on all those comments. Uh, but it's the amazingly beautiful Milankovitch cycles and their profound effect on climate change and seasons. The guy in Scotland who it's, it's not a particularly uh, sexy uh, tone and it's quite dry, but he's got some animations in there and he lays it out so perfectly that I strongly recommend that. It's like I'm recommending books now, but I'm not. And then I did gain quite a bit from Dan Britt. Uh, you can read it as well as I can. So I drew heavily from those, especially the last two that I suggested to you. But it's already 10 o'clock, so I, I don't think I want to show them to you. Back to your questions that I can try. So great question, Marbles Collector. I don't know. We can, reco we can uh, record that, and I can just hit replay. Bill, any connection between the migration of the magnetic pole and procession? Well, Bill, I know you're a geologist, uh, so... Quite often, the, the angle is uh, talking about the magnetic field, et cetera, as the way to solve most of these problems. And I'm always leery of that. Um, but in your case, I mean, if I'm serious about continuing to do these live streams and occasionally trying to do something brand new, like stuff I was meant to look into, it's the magnetic pole stuff. It's the magnetic field stuff. A lot of people are fascinated, whether it's kind of conspiracy angled or just regular. And of course, in Geology 101, we really only talk about the magnetic field, especially the normal versus reverse polarity magne magnetic field story with evidence for seafloor spreading on the oceans of the world. But I don't know of any connection, Bill between the migration of magnetic poles and precession. Oh, you're asking just about the wobble. Many of these might just be questions I'll read and just go, yeah, good thought. All plots are sexy, says Marie. Does precession cause ice ages? Well, Melissa, as I understand it, it's a combination of all of these working together. And that never really felt right to me. In other words, I couldn't teach that. Just kind of say, well, they all these cycles kind of converge or eventually you get three parameters kind of intensifying an effect. I did my best to kind of talk about what I thought was appropriate or kind of the, the, the high ice maker signal for each of those uh, parts of each cycle. Let me find that plot again. So I, I have no idea how uh, extreme this is or if this is common, 
uh, for people to take global climate record over 120,000 years, let's say, and try to show how eccentricity, precession, and tilt are all creating a signal here. But you can see from this at least that, that those cycles are not equal. So this is my best way to show how precession is a factor but none of these by themselves appears to be the smoking gun. And many of us are smoking gun type people. We feel better. We only feel good if we can get one like obvious answer and everything else we can just say is noise or that's common, you know, if you see these presentations. It's a volcanic signature in the last 2.6 million years for global climate change. Everything else is noise. It's a Milankovitch cycle story. Everything else is noise. It's a sunspot story, and everything else is noise. You know what I mean by noise? You know, the, 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 the cycles or the, the variability there is, is hardly anything. It's not explaining these crazy changes. Daniel, did the Milankovitch, did Milankovitch ever work with Brett's? And will you do a live stream on Mount Rainier and the Cascades? Uh, uh, Daniel, thank you for the question. Age 12, I believe. So Milankovitch lived in Europe and Brett's lived in North America. And I'm sure they were not flying back and forth at that time. They also separated time-wise as well. So I know that they didn't work together, but their stories are similar, Daniel. I mentioned Brett's today because both of those men worked very, very hard. And for most of their life, in the case of Malutin, all of his life, um, he had an audience of just a handful of people that confirmed that what he was doing was important and valuable. And that's always a sad story to see that. I have talked about Mount Rainier in the past a little bit. I think next week I am going to do a Lahar show, not just with Mount Rainier, but other volcanoes. It seems like people are wanting a show like that. I see a bunch more uppercase here. Hang on. What did you want to include in this talk that you didn't? I bet it's interesting. I kind of wanted to include some of where we are now with greenhouse gases and focusing on if the Milankovitch cycle is still controlling us. I think another part of this is why don't we have major Milankovitch cycle signals earlier than 2.6 million years ago? I just don't think we do. So like most things, I think there's things to work on. So I, I wanted to do more about Milankovitch versus signals that we have now, but I don't know about the signals, greenhouse gases, et cetera, well enough. So that's motivation. I might ask Susan Kaspari, who I work with, who does ice core work, to, to join us one of these nights and see what she wants to add to this. Maybe she's watching now with her kids. Can effusive events be linked to the Milankovitch cycle? Well, Elaine, that's an interesting thought. So I liked some of what Peter L. Ward was doing, obviously, because I shared it with you. The effect, the global effects of, you know, major flood basalts and the gases that are degassing from the earth during those times and tying those to mass extinctions. Is there a way we can tie some effusive volcanism, volcanic events? Does it have to be either or between the volcanic story and the Milankovitch story? I don't know if anybody's tried to really link those together. Wouldn't an ice age kill far more creatures than global warming? Asks bad hair decade. Wouldn't an ice age kill far more creatures than global warming? Uh, I, I'm not a biologist, bad hair, I'm sorry. I don't know how to answer that. I, I would answer it if I had the background. How does the moon affect the cycles, asks Rick. Again, as promised, I think I'm just gonna read people's questions. Uh, it's not taught that the moon has much effect on global climate at all. What resources do I use or trust to learn science topics like this? 
Uh, that's a good question, Maury Longo, especially with this branch of geology, climate variability. Of course, it's very difficult. And I don't know if you've, if you've watched enough of my stuff to know that I'm not really a follower. I, you know, the way I operate, the way I choose to teach and dress and everything, you know, I just, I just, I like being, I kind of like listening to my own voice. And so I'm not naturally one who just follows the fashions that are in science. And I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you that there are fashions in science where there's a hot topic and everybody's kind of listening and repeating what they hear. And, and sometimes even within the science world, it feels like you get away from the field evidence or it's like some you know, news story that runs its course. And it's like, whatever happened to pit bulls being dangerous, you know? There, there's science equivalents of that too. You, I tried to give you the sense of that here. Nobody's talking about Milankovitch in 1975, and now uh, it's a major part of the program. So that's my best way to answer that question. To specifically answer your question, I'd known a little bit about Milankovitch from Geology 101 textbooks. I found some videos that I thought were fair and balanced. That's, <laughs> I can't believe I just used that phrase. Uh, fair and balanced. Um, but I tried to find resources that use the field data. And that's where I'm going next. If I'm serious about doing another one of these with global climate, I want to go to the ice cores, I think exclusively. And I want to learn what I can about the ice cores themselves. And I feel like I'm just looking for stuff that I can sink my teeth into that is clearly not pushed on me with a certain angle, whether that's within science or not. And it's hard to find those, those kinds of resources. Jamie and Heather, date under precision, Polaris on the chalkboard 200. Uh, I just picked our date, 2020. Uh, I don't know where we are in this cycle. I, I guess we're at Polaris, right? Uh, well, I know we're at Polaris. Ken wants the cozy fort. Sorry. We're, we're, these are running too long. I just looked at the running time from some of these in the last two weeks. Like, I got to scale this back. Gavin, age 11. Where are we now in the Milankovic cycle? Well... Oh, Gavin, I'm not going to show you that plot again. I'll just kind of do it verbally. According to the few resources that I really tried to sink my teeth into, Dan Britt's talk in particular, his main message was, we're in the Milankovitch cycle where our glaciers should be starting to grow. These three things I'm talking about. We should be cooling right now. In other words, if this crazy, this, this very, let's just say the last million years, where we've had this 100,000 year cycle, according to Dan Britt, now I'm putting too much credence in one guy, basically because I don't have a whole lot of background. Uh, his and many others say that, that we should be cooling right now, and yet we're warming quite dramatically. And so, Stay tuned for another program where I try to look at data that's more recent. That's obviously where the, the most discussion will be. The Device 9 wonders if Milankovitch had data from glaciers. He may wear a... I, 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 don't, I, I don't know. Could the cycles contribute to volcanic eruption activity? Could the cycles contribute to the eruption activity? Cheryl. Well, we still don't totally understand what drives the tectonic plates. A whole other area I know very little about. This is geophysics we're talking about now. There's no obvious connection that way. I can see why you're thinking that, but I don't, I don't see how that would work. 
So the three cycles all some so the three cycles all sometimes line up like turn signals blinking at a red light, like turn signals bl blinking at a red light. I think I get that. Uh, something like that. Yeah, it's a, it's a good attempt at an analogy there. Maybe it's an excellent one, and I'm just not bright enough to, to follow it. Pekka Vela, magnetic pole reversals versus Milankovitch cycle. Yeah, I, I am seeing a lot of people want more about magnetic pole reversals. I can tell you that the last magnetic pole reversal was 780,000 years ago. 780,000 years ago is the most recent flip from a reverse polarity to a normal polarity. And we've had, what, at least a half a dozen major ice advances in that, since that time. Um, so just directly, I don't see how magnetic pole reversals influence global climate, but you're asking about the Milankovitch story. I still think the Milankovitch cycles, I mean, these are lots of time, but it's still short time periods compared to at least the almost 800,000 years since we've had our last reversal. More questions along the same lines. Excellent live stream. Follow the money to Al Gore's house. Well, that's, that's an example of hijacking the topic. There's so much that's been tossed into this discussion that it's, it's paralyzing for most. A couple more and we'll quit. Any thoughts on the variability increasing as the residual heat of the planet bleeds off? I assume that's been looked at somehow, Mike. I don't know more than that. Could we use explosives to set off volcanoes to cause global cooling? Tanner in Everett. Well, Tanner, surprisingly, you're not alone in suggesting setting things off. Like 30 years ago when I started teaching a college class, somebody raised their hand in the middle of a volcano discussion and said, why don't we just like, you know, make the volcano erupt so that we don't have to worry about it, we can control it. And I was like completely surprised by that. I get that question every quarter, every quarter. Oh, we're worried about volcanic eruptions or even earthquakes, why don't we just like, you know, set something off so we can have the upper hand. And my answer is always, do you want to be the person to set off the explosive? <laughs> These are forces that are so much bigger than us. So thanks for the idea, but it doesn't seem like a good idea to me. There's so much we don't understand, and many of these forces are so much larger than us that it's difficult to visualize us controlling it. I'm seeing many of the same. I'm sorry if I'm missing your well thought out question. And if there's some specific contributions to this discussion with uh, corrections or additions, I, I'll be, I look forward very much uh, to reading what you have to say. A toast to you. As a little teaser for tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., which is the anniversary weekend of the Mount St. Helens eruption here in Washington State 40 years ago, and by the way, it's all over the media, et cetera, and there were all sorts of live events that were supposed to happen this weekend to commemorate, but of course, we're all at home. Uh, as a little teaser, I think it was Tuesday night, uh, Monday night of this week, I drove up to Snoqualmie Pass and I met a woman at Snoqualmie Pass and we hung out for an hour and she loaded boxes into my van. 
Tune in tomorrow morning to see how that has to do something with the 40th anniversary of Mount St. Helens. What did she load into the back of my van? To you and your health. To the health of your parents and your grandparents and your children and your grandchildren, all of your extended family. How about their health? Here's to their health and your health. Of course, mental health is a special topic for us these days. I hope your mental health is hanging in there the best you can. You're getting good exercise and you get some fresh air and you get some sort of a break occasionally from the stresses that you've been experiencing. I thank you for tuning in this morning. I hope you have a pleasant day or a pleasant evening, depending on where you're watching around the world. And maybe we'll see you tomorrow night. And by tomorrow night, I mean tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Good day from Ellensburg, Washington. I love you. Goodbye.